I've made no secret that Trails from Zero and Trails to Asia are what I consider to be the peak of the Trail series. And over the last two months, I was able to revisit both games with the GeoFrance patch before it was taken down for the official versions. This was my third playthrough of both games, and it will also be the last time I play through Crossbell for a very long time, since there are many other games that I want to play. I personally don't intend to play the official versions, only to buy them and support the developer. So I wanted my last run to utilise the best versions of the game at this point in time. As for the playthrough itself, you'll be unsurprised to know that it was once again an amazing experience. But it got me wondering, why? Why do I consider Crossbell to be masterful and what draws many Trails fans to the allure of Azure and Zero in particular? That's what I try to answer when I revisit a game. However, this video by nature will take on a different style to the revisit of the first two Cold Steel games because rather than looking for a second perspective, especially in the case of Cold Steel 2, the Crossbell games are already in my higher echelons of gaming. Rather than finding shortcomings that take away from the overall experience or looking at previous grievances that needed a second look, this video is more about analysing the areas that make this arc fundamentally strong with examples taken from the games. And with that in mind, I will immediately state that this is not a review of the Crossbell games, I've already done one of those, so don't expect to hear anything regarding gameplay or soundtrack quality here. Rather, a revisit like this is going back to a familiar land and diving a bit deeper into the story and characters that inhabit it, thus finding the key reasons as to why the experience overall holds so much weight from a narrative standpoint, why it remains so memorable. So, it goes without saying that there will be major spoilers for both Zero and Asya in this video. With that warning given, it's time to revisit the SSS in their efforts to get over the barrier. Now, when you consider the key elements of what makes a story, they generally will always have a set structure to them, of which I believe can be split into three main areas. In my eyes, the Crossbell arc excels in its narrative because it clearly defines each of these steps and links them together well through its solid pacing. Those three steps in order are setting the stage, escalating the issue, and finally executing the premise. Immediately, Zero and Azia are met with an unenviable problem in terms of that first step. Due to its small size and geographical location between two superpowers in Erebonia and Calvert, this arc had to present an initially unassailable problem, a barrier that up till this point seems unbreakable for Crossbell in its current state, and thus requires a new method to overcome which eventually leads us to the formation of the SSS. This problem means that we're presented with a compelling and deep issue right away. It's no embellishment to state that Zero gets the arc off to a very good start within the first five hours or so. It demonstrates the Crossbell problem, albeit to a smaller scale, in the early stages. Chapter 1 of Zero sees the SSS uncovering a plot by Ravache, Crossbell's Mafia equivalent, and they eventually are able to thwart their plans for further dominance of the city underbelly after their investigation. However, it becomes clear almost immediately that all of these efforts were for naught. At the conclusion of the chapter, you find out about the apparent powerlessness of those who tried to do good in the States, as it seems that justice doesn't really have a form in Crossbell a theme that is repeated many times throughout this particular game. The Mafia members are released soon afterwards, and Sonya makes it clear to the SSS that this is simply the way things are. The likes of the Guardian Force and the Crossbell Police Departments are not able to assist due to their higher ties to the Diet and thereby the Mafia, and the likes of the Bracers cannot interfere due to their code. It's a situation where the actions of these groups merely paper over the cracks, they can never reach the root of the problem, and thus incidents like this are stuck in a perpetual cycle. It means that this problem requires a group who are under the radar, so to speak, a team that are unfettered by the fawns that surround the heart of the problem, being the SSS themselves, thus giving them a clear and defined role within the story. And the mention of the SSS in of itself leads us to the second structural strength of the Crossbell arc, that being the escalation of the problem in hand, as I feel this point works in unison with the growth of the team as a whole. Now in those initial stages we have Lloyd, Ellie, Tio and Randy, all from completely different backgrounds who are brought together rather unceremoniously. Their formation in of itself is a joke to those who are in the know, with the CPD shunning them represented mostly by the words and actions of Dudley, and the Bracers writing them off as inexperienced, demonstrated by their initial rescue courtesy of Arios in the prologue. Rather, it's the Guardian Force who see the initial worth of the SSS, which eventually gives them the springboard to involve themselves with the more pressing matters. 
These early stages, especially in chapter 1, which set the stage for the narrative direction, also demonstrates the importance of every member within the team and how they contribute to the overall credit of the SSS in the eyes of other parties. Though we will touch on this more later, this is why I always advocate for smaller casts nowadays, as I feel it naturally allows writers to give a more compelling character arc. With an introduction to their problems, a showcase of their skill set, a period of growth or self-reflection, and a fitting conclusion based on the actions they took. The SSS for the most part handles that aspect well, but it's the showcase of the skill sets that I want to focus on here. Every character within the team possesses abilities that contributes to their path forward. Lloyd is a skilled detective, Ellie has the political background of exposure to Zemuria on a grander scale due to her studies, Randy has the boots on the ground know-how and street smarts, and finally Tio has the rational deduction and keen senses. We see various instances where these are all put to use throughout the arc, but the excellence of it is that the diversity in skill set allows the SSS to assist with the problems that face the other organisations like, say, the Bracers, thus demonstrating their worth. Over time, their efforts are rewarded as they are gradually given responsibility for more arduous tasks, like, say, the situation in Chapter 2 of Zero where Ilya asks for the SSS to assist her directly with her own problem. Their growth is a natural trajectory based on their actions, rather than based on their position. They earn their right to partake in these events, which is something that can so easily be missed in stories as far-reaching as these. This idea of giving a believable reason why the main cast can get involved in the first place. It means that as the situation in Crossbell becomes more dire, the SSS grows with it which thus flows well into illustrating the deeper problems the state faces, as if seeing it through their eyes. And the growth of the SSS as a fulcrum feeds into one of the Crossbell arc's greatest strengths that ties everything together so well, which is the pacing of its story. And there is no doubt for me that the Crossbell arc is masterful in this particular area. It's no secret that the Trails games in general are slow burners, formulaic in their approach, but generally able to deliver on the premise they build. It's why I always state that slow pacing is not bad pacing, because the Trail series as a whole demonstrates that as false. As long as you're building up an atmosphere that you will eventually deliver on, then there is no problem in my eyes. And Zero and Asya are the best at that particular facet. In the case of Zero, everything is building up to the reveal of the mystery in the shadows, with small steps that link to each other, like say the discovery of the Gnosis pills for the first time, which immediately links into the follow-up escalation of that initial discovery. The pills themselves act as a catalyst for the continuation of story arcs from previous games, playing on the intricate wide-reaching narrative that is unique to Trails, and the player gets the sense that the perceived pressure surrounding the story is slowly growing, until it results in that excellent finale below the Temple of the Sun. It's a decidedly more eerie ambience as compared to its successor, but it's still excellent pacing nonetheless. You have your clear definition of the problem, the escalation of it through the numerous discoveries made by the SSS, and finally the execution of the main premise in that finale, supported by the excellent characters both new and old. As for Asya, I would argue that it's even better, with a similar structure but arguably higher stakes. You have your key problem introduced first, which follows on from Zero, that being the influence of the superpowers and Crossbell demonstrated by the involvement of Heiyue and the Red Constellation. That premise is then escalated via the Trade Conference. It's clear in this event that the state has very little power compared to its contemporaries, but most importantly, the control that Erebonia and Calvin in particular hold over Crossbell is shown most clearly in this conference. As if looking at two single parents fighting over custody of a child. Notice how Osborne and Rocksmith are pretty much just talking between each other despite the conference housing three other states. It demonstrates a power play that they know they both hold. And that whole section in particular allows the player to empathise with the situation Crossbell finds itself in, as if they're fighting a war on various fronts. Not only are they facing problems within the state itself, like Heiyue and the Red Constellation, but they're also dealing with the looming threat of invasion from Calvin and Erebonia, again raising that perceived pressure once again. The situation is consistently tense, and there's never really a moment that lets up. 
The seeming hopelessness surrounding Crossbell during and after the trade conference especially puts you on the edge of your seat. But that is merely one side of the challenge as the other is to deliver on the premise that has been built up from zero and beyond, which is also done brilliantly in this sequel. The journey we have through Zero and Asia illustrates to the player one thing, that Crossbell faces a seemingly impossible problem. The likes of Zero shows us the deep sickness within the state, and even when that is gone there are external issues to consider as well as shown by Asia. With the situation that Crossbell finds itself in, you would be forgiven in believing that only a miracle could save it, and that's exactly what is attempted. This theme of submission and servitude is countered via divine intervention, which naturally feeds into the overarching plot of Trails itself, and again, it is that pacing that sells it so well. I still consider the final third of Asia to be the best execution of a premise in any JRPG to date. Everything from the moment where Diete declares the independent state of Crossbell to the rolling of the credits is just pure bliss. There is always something happening, whether that be the solving of the overarching mystery, the eventual future path of Crossbell as a state, or the satisfactory conclusion of character arcs. And yes, even though I still consider that ending to be the best that Trails has to offer even to this day, I feel that another key part of why this execution is so good in Asia as it was in Zero is once again linked to the characters we meet during the journey, as a compelling plot is nothing without its actors. So let's have a look at those now. As said before, I much prefer smaller main casts to larger ones, and the Crossbell arc was the main reason for that. One of my biggest problems with the original Class 7 in the Cold Steel arc was that they were far too large, there were too many individuals to give meaningful development or importance to in the space of those two games, and it resulted in some of them being left behind for the benefit of others. But my real issue with them was that I couldn't grasp the chemistry in this group, they didn't feel like a close group of friends, Rather, it was a cluster of individuals with Reen at the centre who tied it all together. I don't actually remember the likes of Laura talking to Eustis directly at least in a meaningful situation or Fee talking to Marcius outside of teasing him once or twice. If you want to sell camaraderie to me, you have to show it. And that is what the SSS does better than any of the other groups in my mind. They feel like a team rather than a group of individuals. There are so many moments where the bonds of the SSS are demonstrated to us, a good example here is Tio sharing her past with the other members and the other three accepting and supporting her despite her own doubts. Regardless of her harrowing experiences before she joined, they all say they will help her, and it allows Tio herself to feel like she isn't alone and she can now try to rediscover this idea of being human that was robbed of her during the Gnosis experimentations, because the SSS provides the environment by which you can do that. Compelling character arcs like this are abundant in the Crossbell arc, and it's not all just tied to the SSS, you have other clearly defined characters who are strong in their own right, like Ren, Dudley and Noel. Whether they continue their arcs from previous titles or have their own lesser focused individual stories, their foundation remains solid, enough so that they can be built upon in those future games which is key in the long running narrative that Trails continues to weave. But we've talked extensively about the protagonists, so let's flip the coin here. What about the antagonists? How do they contribute to the excellent narrative that Zero and Asia demonstrates? For me personally, the greatness of an antagonist is tied to their extended presence within the game. The longer the stay or importance of the individual, the deeper I want the character arc to be. For example, if Weissman had been in every single Trails game as simply a bad guy with no supporting backstory, I would not consider him to be a good antagonist, he would just be plain and boring to me. Weissman is a well-written antagonist because he doesn't overstay his welcome. He's reprehensible, abhorred, and his eventual end is extremely satisfying as a result. It's the same deal with Joachim in Zero, he doesn't overstay his welcome, he's just straight up evil, and there is definitely a place for that type of character in stories like this. However, as their importance grows, I need added layers to the character. I want to try and empathise with the situation the antagonist finds themselves in. Why did they choose to go down this path and what could have possibly led them to commit the acts they have? I think Azur in particular demonstrates this better than any Trails game thus far. The likes of Arios and Diete in particular are great antagonists, individuals who have shown their despair for the state that Crossbell finds itself in on several occasions throughout the journey of the SSS. Their experiences and eventual lack of hope led to them seeking a miracle in order to cure Crossbell of its latent sickness, and though their method was misguided, I can understand why they chose the path they did. At the end of the day, they have witnessed the problems facing Crossbell for a longer period than the likes of the SSS have so it's only natural that their methods would become more desperate as a result. 
and then we consider the main mastermind. Now this character, Ian Grimwood, is a contentious one for some fans who feel that his involvement in the Asia Zero project was contrived. But for me personally, I am all on board with Ian's position in this story. Considering that many of the issues facing Crossbell are political in nature, it makes sense that someone with a socio-political background would be the one to harbour such animosity for its position. While the likes of the SSS see incidents on the surface, the likes of Ian with his legal knowledge realises the crux that holds back the state in its most concrete form, in writing. We see him before the trade conference in particular mulling over the legal reforms for example, and it's as if he has seen the source of the problem but knows its remedy is barred off through the use of conventional means. So when rational methods fail, you turn to the miracles bestowed by the goddess to make the change instead. In terms of motivation, I have no problem with his character. Rather, my real issue with Ian is tied to those moments before the final battle. By this point, you have to consider that the Asia Zero project has been in motion for over a decade, and now it's finally at its climax. This is a man who was continually keeping the train in motion, who even shot a friend to keep the secret from escaping. At that point, you would think that his resolve to see it through would be set in stone. However, come a two-minute speech from Lloyd, he changes his mind, and wants no part of it. That's odd to me. You can say that maybe he was always wavering a bit in his conviction, especially if that letter to Pete is anything to go by, but I was always perplexed by that sudden change of heart. I understand that Ian himself is not evil in the general sense, he's simply doing what he feels is right for his country, but with so many years of planning and exposure to Crossbell's problem, you would think he would have the conviction to see it through to the end. Though I will always say that the cast of Crossbell is my favourite in the series, it is a small gripe of mine on an otherwise near-perfect adventure. Now moving aside from the characters and the glowing praise as a whole, we've already touched on one problem with this arc, or at least I see it that way. But do Zero and Asia possess any other shortcomings or areas that are highlighted because of how stellar the majority of the journey is? Well, as I continue to play through, my initial thoughts on this specific area that always stuck with me in the past was reinforced even more. I think it's fair to say that Falcom are not good at optional content, not lately at least. Take the new Game Plus ending of Cold Steel 2 or the after credit scene in Cold Steel 4 that can easily be missed if you don't go through them twice. For me, optional events should simply be that. Hidden instances, the key word here being hidden, that have no bearing on the main story or a character arc. Rather, they should just function as a reward for those who want to go above and beyond in their playthrough. And no doubt, the Crossbell arc has some excellent optional content. The Kia Penguin scene is perfect. It doesn't hold any plot significance or character information. It's simply a fun and light-hearted rendition for those who bought the various gifts. The hidden quest where you practice Sully's dancing routine is also a great optional event. We know that Sully is attempting to stand on equal footing with Elia and Risha in their performances and she's pushing herself to do so. This quest is simply reinforcing that aspect of her character that we already know about. But then there's the bad optional content, like the final scene with Risha and Wazi aboard the Merkaba. Poor Wazi doesn't even get a backstory for the most part unless you do this scene, and Risha barely touches on hers during that day of rest at Michelin Resort. Events like this that give us key information regarding a main character need to be shown to the player, and if it leads to said player developing a greater interest in them, then they can look for the optional content that reinforces and plays off what they already know, such as a quirky personality trait. And if I'm being really critical, it's not just linked to these characters. We're once again going back to Lawyer Ian as a lot of the build-up to his eventual reveal is locked behind some hidden events, easily missable ones as well like the Nielsen questline. The final quest in particular does a great job in contributing to Ian's motivations further. You can understand his situation far more if you do these hidden quests, whereas if you see him simply pop up in the story as the main antagonist later on, the player may be incredulous as to what has just happened and I can't blame them for believing it to be contrived. There's no doubt that the more cryptic areas of what I consider to be important content started to become more notable in the Crossbell arc, and it definitely remains my biggest gripe of the games. But despite that, I'm not going to let some individual grievances go too heavy against them, as it barely tarnishes what is, in my mind, the jewel in the trail's crown. Zero and Asia still remain at the peak of the summit. So coming to the end of this video, I hope that this has given you a better idea as to why I hold the Crossbell Arc in such high regard. It excels in the areas that I hold most important in my experiences, that being narrative quality, pacing, and deep, thought-provoking characters. 
Trails from Zero and Trails to Azure both display that to a notably high level, and though I don't intend to play the official versions when they release, I will never forget the journey they both gave me.